Hey, welcome to Synth Seeker. Today we are going to take a piece of music that I've written and we're going to deconstruct it. Uh, it's written, inspired by uh, the Berlin School, and a little bit of synthwave feel. And uh, what I'm going to do is it's broken up into sections. And we are going to take each section uh, and sort of deconstruct it, analyze it. We'll talk about what techniques were used, uh, how they fit together, and uh, really see if any of that is useful for you working in your music. Uh, so this is a sort of a practical by example deconstruction of some Berlin school slash synth wave. Let's get started. So here's our project. Okay. We let's talk about some instrumentation. So um, we have uh, a simple bass here. Uh, we've got uh, some sort of Berlin-esque plucks. Okay. I've also got a soft pad going on here. Slow attack. Right. Uh, then for our leads, for our melody lines, there's two versions. We've got a sort of a soft melody, which is almost vocal. Right. That's running through a resonator. That's giving you some sort of like a crystalline sort of warbling. If you sustain it. I'm not going to get too much into sound design. Uh, I have other videos about that, but so when you're working on a song, uh, the way I work is that I go and I pick the palette, the sound palette that I want in advance, get those in place, and then go forward. Another melody line we want is a brighter lead. All right. Uh, so that's our sort of our sound set that we're working with in this uh, particular piece. We've got some uh, drum loops and some transition sounds. So let's get started. Uh, what we're looking at here is there is an intro and an outro, and then nine uh, sort of distinct sections. Some of the sections are related in that uh, uh, one section will almost repeat or repeat with variation what was in the previous uh, sort of section. And some of the sections are standalone, like we want a significant change, like an A to a B change, uh, right? Or we want some sort of bridge in there. As I talk about this, I'm going to use as little sort of music theory jargon as possible. I want this to be sort of practical and take things apart in a way that you could sort of reconstruct them in your own work, regardless of what you know about music theory. Because my music theory is relatively uh, weak, <laughs> and I'm no expert. Uh, so if you hear me describing something that uh, has a clear concept in music theory, but I'm not using the right words for it, that's okay. You could say so in the comments, tell me what I'm missing or tell me what, what the name of that thing is, right? Or if I'm using a, a particular music theory term incorrectly, feel free to correct me. Um, clarify it for anyone else who comes after and runs into this. That's fine. So if we get started with section one, what I'm going to do as we go through these sections is I'm just going to play the 16 sort of bars of the section or eight bars of the section. Um, and I'll play through it once and then we'll take it apart. So here's section one. So section one, let's take this apart. There's three instruments playing uh, besides rhythm. Um, we've got our plucks. So let's take a look at these. This pattern uses these notes. All right, so that's our root note and two octaves above it. And then there's these fifths in there. All right, and then one fourth. So what this does is it forms a chord that's all right. And if we let this play, when you combine that with our delay, this is like classic Berlin school. Right. There are eighth notes that are playing, or sixteenth notes. Yeah, sixteenth. Notes. 
And that's the whole pattern. It's um, this repeating sort of figure, this repeating pattern that runs underneath stuff. And then we've got a melody sort of playing over it, and we've got some chords we'll look at that play over it. Sometimes this is referred to as an ostinato. It's this repeating figure. All right. So we start with that. Then we've got these pads playing over it. It's just three chords. So you can hear the pattern that ostinato is, has, it's not changing. It's just sort of playing that root fifth with an occasional fourth in there. And our chords are shifting on top of it. And emotionally, that's really sort of compelling, right? It makes a nice sort of progression. And now what are these chords? Okay, so these are, um, if we're in C minor, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, an eight or C again. This first note, we're playing uh, a fifth interval. Okay, that's a C and a G. Right? And you could say this is the, in this scale, this is a, a, the minor triad. It's the one chord for C minor. From there, we go to the three chord. One, two, three. Right, so we're actually playing these two notes. We're not playing the full triad, but it would be. And then we go to the seventh, but an octave lower. We play. But here we're not playing the full triad, we're just playing the, that part of it. So the chords are one, three, and seven. Sort of. It's implied. And so that pattern is running over top of our ostinato, and that forms the first section. Look at them together. Now we've got a melody running on top of that. Let's look at that. All right, so let's look at this in isolation as we listen. So this eight bar melody is really just two, uh, four bar melodies repeating. With a very slight variation, just this one note. So melodies don't have to be a whole bunch of uh, notes played very quickly, this flurry, right? The space um, between notes and the length of notes that are held is sort of like a breathing, right? This sounds like a conversation. Um, now there's some rhythmic repetition in that each sort of phrase in the conversation has a similar rhythmic pattern. They're all going da, 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 da. And then it repeats again. We breathe around measure four here. And then we say da, 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 da. And it's not perfect repetition, but it is conversational, melodic repetition. Right? And the notes themselves, the pitches, they are for the most part the same, except for this one small variation. That's something you can use. Right? So even within a single pattern, we think in terms of repeating patterns, like I'm going to repeat this pattern for 32 bars or something like that. Well, here's a relatively short pattern, but within the pattern itself, we have two musical phrases that are repeated twice and then within each musical phrase we have a repeated rhythmic sort of pattern in that the the way the conversation is being spoken is itself a repeating pattern and why do we like repetition right because the when things repeat they are validated they are glued into our brain uh, repetition is a good thing all right, let's talk about section two. Let's listen to it once.
Okay, so section two and section one are very similar. If we just look at the, the patterns uh, on the timeline here, uh, we have the same series of plucks. That's so that ostinato carries over again into the second section. Our chord progression is the same. Our chords playing our one, three, and seven uh, sort of broken chords is uh, repeating again. Our soft lead, our conversational lead, falls away. It isn't here, right? And we've added this bass line. We'll look at that in a second. And we've introduced a second lead line with a brighter tone using the brighter lead sound. Uh, so let's look at the bass real quick because it's a little simpler. So here's our bass part. Right, synth wave sort of tone, a little Berlin school. So what do you see here? Right, this is a repeating figure. It's the root note of the, of the scale. It's just mostly C's. Uh, repeating from measure to measure. Rhythmically, the pattern's repeating, so that's validating itself. We've got a little variation at the end where we do a little step up from the sort of this uh, B flat to C. So we establish this root of C. That's an accent. Right? Uh, so this little uh, this B flat here leading into C, that B flat adds tension. If your ear is used to hearing C and C and C and you drop it a half step just for a moment before going back to the C that we're used to hearing, that adds a little tension that immediately gets resolved. Right? Your brain finds that pleasing. And then at the very end of the pattern, we have just a slight change in the rhythmic pattern to shake things up a little bit and not get too boring. Okay, so the bass line's pretty simple. And then our new bright lead comes in, and now this is a bit more energetic as far as melodies go. Now, it's harder to see here, but this too has got an internal repeating rhythmic pattern. So you can see these are in groups of three. We zoom in a little bit, right? It's one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. And they're mostly going up, boo doo boop boo doo boop except for the end of the phrase. This one alternates down, up, down, right? And it continues on. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and then a flourish to, for some variation. And then it continues repeating again. A little more flourishes, if I zoom back out, what happens is in the second half of this, we don't repeat it verbatim. I'm putting in a few, a little more variation in here. But once we've established sort of this pattern, So I'll say it again, uh, repetition sort of validates what's going on. Um, uh, who, who says this? Um, Adam Neely or Rick Beato. There's a couple other YouTube people I like to watch um, in the music space, and they say this a lot, and it's very true, right? Repetition um, trains the ear to ex have expectations, and then it's happy when those expectations are met, and it's also happy when those expectations are shaken up a little bit. So you want to establish some repetition, and then break it up a bit. So the first half of this pattern is establishing this rhythmic pattern, da 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 um, And then the second one maintains the tonality. It's still working within sort of the same chords, um, but then shakes the repetition up. But that first half repeated it enough to set it into your brain, right? So, so section two is really the same as section one. We've added this low bass. We've removed our soft lead, replaced it with a bright lead. And there you go. All right. Now section three sounds more like this. So section three changes things up a bit. Um, 
it's more of an evolution of section two. Okay, so we carry over that ostinato, that 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 plucky Berlin school ostinato. It's still there, right? It's carried over from section one to section two. It's at section three now. But because it's just really root and fifths within the key, it's noodling around the one and the five. We can play a lot of things over top of that uh, and change up the flavor of this pattern. Uh, and what we do, um, or what I did here, is I then gave it a distinctly different bass line. The previous pattern's bass line has been pretty much hovering at the root on C. Uh, this time, I'm implying some new chords. Right, so here we are hovering at C. We drop to F. Drop to E flat. And the pattern, the rhythmic pattern of that bass is this driving pattern, right? Bum, 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 bum. It's really sort of starting to amp up some of the emotions of, uh, of the rhythm of the system. So if we look at the bass combined with this lead that comes in, let's take this apart. All right, let's hear just this. Okay, so we've basically got two musical phrases here, they, and it repeats. Um, and so we've got our bass line running, and we've got this sort of soft melody over it having this conversation. Now, if we take the melody apart, we see again a rhythmic pattern being repeated over. Right? Right, we've got this rhythmic pattern. Right? It happens here, happens here happens here, a little walk up, and that repeats, establishing sort of this conversational pattern, ba-da-bop, bop ba da bop ba da bop a little flourish, a variation, and then we're back to ba da bop and it repeats again across the second half of the pattern. It isn't repeating the pitches, it's repeating the phrasing of the notes. Bada bop, bada bop. Right. Uh, so that's a mechanism you can use when you're writing melodies. Right. You can choose to have um, a series of pitches. Right. That's within key or not. But generally, you know, you tend to stay in key for your melody. Um, and you don't necessarily want to have um, a sort of uh, solid, continuously repeating rhythmic pattern. You want to have something that um, has internal repeating rhythmic patterns, right? So that's what we have here. It's phrasing, it's having a conversation. Now that is in contrast to the baseline, which is this driving ducka, 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 ducka baseline that itself moves through the chords of the, of the progression. So if we look at these together, let's look at this melody with the soft lead and the bright lead. Okay, so we've got these two instruments that are playing in this pattern, and they're playing exactly the same notes. The sort of uh, lavender is the soft lead, and the sort of pinkish is the bright lead. And they're playing the same notes exactly. We're having a true repetition between the first and second half of this pattern. But in the second half, the bright lead changes the timbre. Right. So you can play the same melody, you can repeat it exactly, and then if you change the timbre up, that's enough to drive interest in your ear. Make sense? Okay, and lastly, at the end of this pattern, what we've got going on is we've got our melodies playing. Our soft melody plays, and then it repeats with the bright melody on top of it, 
And then additionally, we've got the same instrument for the bright sort of melody sound playing this low counterpoint underneath. Um, I think it's a counterpoint. It, counterpoint may not be the right word for it, but it's basically playing um, some harmony parts uh, that are rhythmically interesting um, uh, underneath the melody. So it would sound like... So there's our statement of the melody. Now we're going to repeat it with counterpoint. Okay, and so when you take it all together, what you've got is this ostinato running in the background, this sort of pluck, this sort of Berlin pluck going. We've got this driving bass line going through our chord progression. We have a conversational sort of melody with a lot of internal rhythm repeating. That melody itself repeats in the second half of the pattern with a timbre change. The, the bright instrument plays it as well as the sort of mellow instrument. And at the same time, laid underneath that is this um, sort of, um, I'm calling it counterpoint, but a sort of harmonic, plucky uh, accentuation of the sort of underlying bed sounds. So there's the statement of our melody. We repeat it with the brighter tone. And you hear the underscore there. And that is section three. Uh, I think of section four is the B part. I said, okay, let's completely change it up. Um, and we're going to let this drive with, uh, we're going to use the bass line and we're going to have um, the soft and bright leads do some sort of harmony thing on top of it. We're going to drop the ostinato out. We're not going to have any chords, uh, pads playing underneath it. We're going to change the drum part up uh, and sort of give us a different feel. So this is section four. So section four, how is this built? Uh, if we go look at our bass, here's our bass part. We've got some rhythmic repetition going in here in that the bass line has changed, but is repeatedly going bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, this sort of syncopated feel. It's not right on the downbeats. Bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, right? That's a bit of a hook, rhythmic hook that you can get in there with the bass line. It's different from the previous pattern, so it sort of gets the brain to sit up and say, what, what's just changed? Okay, our melody parts are playing unison. Uh, our, our sort of mellow lead and our bright lead are playing on top of each other as they walk through this. So the way we build through this pattern with the melody is we're building tension, ba dum bump bump ba da da right? All the held notes are really on the, they're not on downbeats, they're on the ands, they're in the, on the in-betweens, right? So ba dum bump bump ba da bump right? These held notes are not on downbeats, right? And it's to sort of, um, I'm not sure they're leading tones, but they're definitely, um, they get resolved a moment after they actually start playing and that tension that's building up gets released by this sort of wash down and then we start building it up again and then we release that tension back down and then towards the end of the section we build up our pattern uh, build up that tension and then we really push it up even higher and we change our rhythmic structure where we had sort of been doing these runs as 16th notes here we do them as uh, dotted uh, dotted eighths, I think. Yeah, those look like dotted eighths. We do this as this dotted eighth run, which has almost a triplet feel, right? As it goes down, resolve, 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 and then 
we can move on. There isn't much else going on in here. We've got the bass, this melody going. Um, the drums change up significantly in that uh, it, this is, I think, the only place in this piece where we play around the hi-hats have a phaser applied to them to sort of give some motion there. Because we've dropped the ostinato and we don't have pads playing in the background. Um, there needed to be a little bit more motion in there, so we applied a phaser or flanger to the, uh, I think it's a phaser, to the hi-hats. That gives us sort of what we want to fill in the gaps that we left by dropping the ostinato and dropping the pads. Ba bump 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 build tension. Ba da bump build tension. Build tension higher and then change the rhythmic pattern to resolve it down. Okay, and that's section four. Let's move on to section five. Section five is another part change. If section four was sort of the B part, section five is the C part or bridge. Um, I'm not sure what you would call it, right? But again, we, we change it up. Uh, this section this section's really meant to shake things up a bit. Um, after section four, you know, two, th one, two, three, four, we're all relatively related. Um, and section five is sort of driven by this walk down that ends so actually outside the current key. Um, let's listen to it. All right, so we have this internal pattern, rhythmic pattern, repeating. It repeats across our chord progression. It's training our ear to expect this. And then in the fourth sort of repetition, right? In that fourth repetition, we break everything. We go outside our key. We maintain sort of the same rhythmic pattern, but we shift our sort of note selection to spread it out a bit more. And then at the end, we just sort of do a flourish as we go. Um, it's a nice change, right? Now our previous sort of Berlin School plucks, what are they doing in here? They're following the, the sort of root note of each chord as we go down. They're playing a step sequencer pattern. You could use an arpeggiator for this. But they also go outside the key. That last one is rooted in C sharp. Uh, as we keep going, what our leads are doing. All right, so here's our bass line rolling down, as we saw. And our leads aren't doing anything dramatic. They're not playing a big flurry of notes. There's no licks in here. It's just nice harmonies being built. They are a fourth apart. And as they play through, uh, they're just repeating their own internal rhythm. Like in the first couple bars here, we've got this. And then it repeats again. Different tonality as we're moving through the chord progression. Here it is again. One little flourish there. A little breaking up the rhythmic pattern, but still sort of maintaining it. And then at the end a complete sort of uh, variation, then we're going to break it again. So this whole sort of section is setting up this rhythmic repeating expectation and chord progression that slowly falls apart by the end of the section. There's a phrase, breathe. There's another phrase, and then we inhale. And then we break it up. Okay, so that's really how that's put together. Now that bass line and that progression taking us down, that C sharp outside the key, it really wants us to resolve back to C, right? So what do you think section six is going to start with? All right, we've got a drop but we've resolved back to C. That's a C7, sort of broken. And then a walk up. And so we've got this C7. And that just holds out. So that's a resolution, but that's, uh, that's seven. It's giving us something a little different. It's this, right? 
just broken. I'm not where I, I'm not sure what the right sort of uh, theory way of expressing this is, but all right, that's my C, that's my third, and that's my seven, and we're just playing the third an octave up. All right. And then at the end here, right, we've got our G, our A flat. B flat, right? And that's just if we play the triads there, right? It's just a walk up back to our C7 again. Right? Now this is sort of the payoff pattern. This is where it starts. Uh, section six, uh, six, seven, and 8 are this progression repeated, uh, each repeating, adding a little bit each time. So by the third time we've got sort of this big emotional payoff uh, using this. In six, we just drop out. Um, we drop out the ostinato. Our plucks are still playing, but they're mimicking the main uh, sort of soft vocal melody, right? The, the bass kicks in in the very last measure to lead us into section seven, which we'll hear in a second. That talks. That's the same thing, but with the bass and a little rhythm in there. Um, and then we've got this uh, our pad playing, right? Um, but we've ad the addition of uh, a secondary. Uh, laid on top of it. That's doing sort of a gated pattern, uh, an octave up. All right. So let's hear six, and then we'll roll it into seven, and you'll hear how it sort of builds on top of that. All right. So we had this drop in six. We're sustaining this sort of C7 chord, and then we're going to walk back up, back up to C7, and in section seven, our rhythm come back, comes back in. We've got our driving bass. Right, and our bass is establishing a sort of new chord progression. So, chords stay the same, melody stays the same. We've introduced this bass line on top of it. So what are we looking at here? Our bass is playing our root of C. Drops down to A flat. Drops down to F. All these are still in key. And then follows our walk up. So seven and six are the same section, same basic patterns. It's just adding some emotional content, adding some instrumentation. We get a bass on top of it, the rhythm section kicks back in. And then section eight repeats it again. This time the variation is that we're going to add even more rhythm on top of it, and we're going to repeat our melody with the bright lead laid on top of the soft lead. So let's hear seven leading into eight. bright lead. We've got the sort of more rock drums playing through it. And that's our sort of emotional payoff as we're going through this. And we roll into section nine. All right now section nine is sort of a bookend, right? This song you could think of from bookends is a phrase you'll use where you've got the sort of same uh, look and feel the same sort of um, state of the song at the beginning and the end. So 9 is going to restate something hap that happened earlier. So chord progression from earlier in the song. Right, so nine is a restatement of two, right, same. 
Here's our bass, our plux, our same chord progression, our same bright lead pattern. So we've built up this as sort of emotional payoff section through six, seven, and eight. Uh, and then building out, we sort of come back to uh, looping around to the beginning of our song with section nine. Now our outro and our intro are really just pared down versions of that pattern. So if we ever listen to, um, if you listen to the intro, what it is is the same as section one with a few things pulled out. The lead makes its appearance during the intro, but the pads are essentially the same. It's the, and there's no rhythm. Uh, the outro is similar. The pluck ostinato continues to play in the outro, but slowly sort of decays down. You can see. Right here's our ostinato playing, and then we drop and we drop and until it's just this root note playing. Um, the pads continue to play our progression with an extra repetition of the beginning, and then this resolution on C that sort of fades out at the end. This is a song that fades out. And then our soft lead gets restated, cleaned up, and then makes a final statement. Um, and really that's about it. So I'm not sure how useful this was, but it was certainly useful for me to sort of disassemble this and understand how I'm building it. Um, some quick highlights are think in terms of repeating patterns, repeating figures, right? So an ostinato, a Berlin school bed, it's basically this repeating pattern, repeating through the piece. You vary things on top of it. So if you change lay the chords over that, right? So we've got our repeating pattern and we shift our chords on top of it to add tension and release tension. Um, your melodies are conversations. They have internal repeating rhythms. Da da da, da da da, da da da, da 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 da, right? There's a whole phrase repeating internal rhythms. That whole phrase repeats da da da, 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 repeating rhythms. Okay? You want to breathe in between your phrases if you can. Empty space is good. Held notes are good. Um, and then essentially move yourself through. Uh, different patterns within the key. You can change up your chord progressions. We have sort of the same sort of feel through sections one, two, and three. Section four changes the chord progression up. Section five changes it up again. And then six changes it and then repeats itself, adding instrumentation and adding sort of tension, um, uh, more weight to the sort of arrangement as it builds up. And then nine bookends, it resolves back. Nine is a repetition of two. And then we have our outro. That's it. I'm going to play the song in its entirety. Uh, the song is actually not complete. I'm still going through and adding more flourishes, more variation. There's always places uh, where you can improve it. Um, I'm not even getting to mixing yet. I'm just still in the composing phase. But it's a lot of fun. I love doing it. Uh, I hope you enjoy making music as much as I do. Eventually this will get released. This project is actually um, intended to be used alongside a graphics demo. Uh, with uh, a, a few people I know who are building a graphics demo for an upcoming trade show. So eventually this will um, reach a deadline where I have to say, okay, that's good enough and it'll be done. It's going to be in June. Uh, and once it ships uh, and they have their trade show and they, they sort of premiere the demo, I'll release this in its uh, final form. But thanks for listening. I hope this was useful for you. Any questions you have or clarifications, if you have a greater knowledge of music theory than I, and you can clarify what I was trying to get across in some of these, please do leave comments. Uh, people can only benefit from having more voices in the conversation, uh, but do so, you know, uh, as convenient. And as always, you have been watching Synth Seeker. Have a great day.